Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you all gathered out this evening. Welcome you all here. Welcome you all along. Um, maybe we'll start our time together by uh, singing number 392 in your hymn books. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And uh, if you're able to stand, please stand with us as we sing together. Thank you. announcements for the the week ahead uh, and in the next week um, do remember the the services this Sunday Lord's Day morning and evening and Pastor Dodds will be along from Stone Park Baptist and he'll be responsible for both morning and evening and as we mentioned on Sunday the evangelism team um, from the Baptist College will be coming along from Sunday evening so there will be some of the the men will be uh, testifying on Sunday evening and then starting uh, Monday they will be involved in various outreach work um, Monday through certainly through uh, Friday there will be the amazing journey uh, in the schools that they'll be working with and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment or two they'll be doing door-to-door -door work and street work in the town um, seeking to evangelize and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening, there will be a family mission from 6.45, and that is really targeted towards young people and their families um, to come along. And that'll be 6.45 to 7.30 in the hall upstairs. So if you do know anybody that you can invite along to that, please do endeavor to do so. Um, as I mentioned on Sunday, um, next week, our prayer and Bible study will be on Monday evening at 7.30 here uh, in, the, in the room, um, given everything else that's going on. So please do remember that. 
Monday evening next week for our prayer and Bible study at 7.30. And I'm not actually sure who's responsible for that. I'm sure it'll be some, some of the team um, will, be, will be taking part in that. But please do remember that Monday evening 7.30 instead of the usual Wednesday. The family mission, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening, and then Friday evening, there's a special night for the Baptist youth uh, and open to uh, the young people from 8 o'clock and it'll be a question answer and answer session with the uh, the team that are here this week, or next week, sorry, I should say. Um, in terms of, and uh, hopefully this will play ball for me, um, in terms of the amazing journey, um, maybe this will come up, maybe it won't. If it doesn't, I can talk through it. Um, Brian has put together a timetable um, covering the various schools that the, the team will be going into. Knock the light off, just so that um, you can pray in a more informed manner. So uh, as you see there, Wednesday in Drumran, um, I'm covering a total of 137 pupils, DV. Uh, Rural Valley integrated then on Thursday, uh, 177 pupils, and then Drummer Coast on the Friday, um, and 224 pupils. Now, I believe the team will be coming back again in the new year um, to cover some of the schools that they weren't able to get this week. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a possibility. I'll say, put it like that. So you can pray for that as well. But um, certainly for next week, do play, pray for these schools um, and pray for the team as they go in. And as we announced on Sunday, if you're able to help uh, in the, the practical matters during those couple of days with the team, um, it's not too late to put your name on the sheet. And it's, don't worry, you won't be asked to dress up as, as some of the biblical characters. It's really just to help with the setting up and the preparation of the food for the, the young people and so on. So, uh, as I say, if you're able to help with in any way with that, please do put your name on the sheet. And um, there's still room for those who are able to help with the, the catering and things for the, uh, the various nights next week as well. So please do remember that. Uh, in your prayers especially remember the team as they come along and do remember Brian as well Cormac will maybe say a little bit more about it this evening but Brian will be going down to North Dublin and um, I do want to introduce our speaker this evening um, and their cards prayer cards in the in the hall there um, Cormac Walsh um, with Baptist Missions and he's down with his wife and family in North Dublin um, and he's come along this evening to tell us a little bit about the work there. So thank you for coming tonight, Cormac. Um, and we pray God's blessing upon you. Um, perhaps just before I hand over to Cormac, um, we'll just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. And forgive me if I've forgotten any of the announcements, but um, there's quite a lot next week. So please do remember those things. Our Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for the opportunity again to gather together in your house. And Lord, we thank you um, for your servant who has come along this evening to share a little bit about the, the work that he's involved in um, in your corner of the vineyard there in North Dublin. And Lord, we, we just pray, Lord, that as he would uh, share with us, that you would um, help us to be mindful of those things that we need to pray for. Uh, and Lord, that we would be able to support your servant there. We also pray again, Lord, for the, uh, the team as they would come along next week, um, as they would undertake in the amazing journey and the, uh, the various outreach um, means, and also, Lord, for the family mission uh, throughout, throughout the course of the week, uh, and for the young people who come along there, Lord. And above all else, we pray that uh, as souls would hear the, the message of the gospel, that your Holy Spirit would work in their lives, convict them of their sin, Lord, and save them, and that your name would be glorified. Lord, we remember those who are unable to be with us this evening, um, whether it's their sickness or infirmity, and Lord, we just pray that you would draw close to them, uh, even where they are tonight, Lord. Lay your healing hand upon them and minister unto them, Lord. 
And so, Lord, we pray that as we would gather together this evening, that um, you would bless our time together. Um, and, Lord, again, that uh, all that would be said and all that would be done would be for your honor and your glory. So we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. We'll, uh, that felt a bit old, but I'm fairly confident we'll get there. Um, um, yeah, my name is Cormac, uh, Cormac Welsh. Um, I am from Kerry originally, so if you drive down south for probably six hours or something you get to, to where I grew up. Um, I grew up in a, a small church plant. My parents were, were Catholics, became believers uh, three or four um, and um, as part of they were probably the second family to become believers in a small church plant that grew up there um, and so from that very young age I was very sure the gospel was powerful. I saw that it changed lives wasn't too sure what the gospel was for a long time, but um, since growing up in that, um, I think even before it was fully clear what the gospel was, I was I could see the power of the gospel, the power of church planting. Um, so as I grew in knowledge of the gospel, I began to faith myself. Um, this before I knew about Baptist missions, um, this was what I wanted to be involved in: proclaiming Christ, planting churches. Um, so. The last two and a half years I've been working with Baptist Missions um, and it's, it's just a, it's been a, a massive joy to have that just clarity over what the job is um, and to, to have churches in our association have such support that I can come and I've, I've, I met Brian today but I've never met any of you just before now and we can have confidence that we have that unity in the gospel and we have a message to proclaim and that is the way to plant churches. So, so thanks for having me. I'm going to, the first half of this is going to be um, our story, the situation in, in North Dublin, our family, how we've ended up where we are. Um, and then the second half will be looking at a Sam that is, has shaped our ministry more than anything else over the last year. Um, so a few pictures, um, this is my family. Um, you can see me, my wife Anya is from North Dublin. Um, again, became a believer in the mid-teens from, from a, a Catholic background and um, didn't know any churches, had to go to a completely different part of, of the, the city to, to find the church. Um, so we were, we got married, we met in college, um, got married, we were in Mayo, helping start a, a little church there in Ballinac and Mayo. And I think about nine-ish years ago, we were thinking, where are we going to go to be committed to long-term? Because in Ireland, probably everywhere, but especially in Ireland, the longer you stay in a place, the more effective you are. Um, so we just wanted to think, where can we commit, put down roots and commit to you know, proclaiming Christ, planting churches. Um, so we, we moved to North Dublin, very close to where Ani grew up um, in 2015. And um, we have three children. So Tomas is seven, Cara is five, and Senan is three. Um, so that's, that picture is about a year old. They, hard to get them to sit still. So that's kind of the most recent <laughs> we've got. Um, this is a map, I love maps. Um, this is what I would call North City Dublin. So um, that river down the bottom there, that's the, the Liffey kind of divides the South and the North. The North is poorer than the South, um, but it's still, you know, it's, not, it's still a pretty wealthy, it's still an expensive place to buy a house. Um, so the South is wealthier and probably more historical Protestant presence. Um, there's still a small minority there, but there's almost none in the north side, uh, just for various re reasons. So that area, that red boundary area, what I'd call North City Dublin, um, 230,000 people. Um, and as of three years ago, there was um, three churches. Um, so Jameson Road Baptist Church, uh, Baptist Church has been there about 130 years, two pretty small Pentecostal churches. Um, and there's a lot of immigrant churches that are reaching, you know, Nigerian people or Indian people in various languages. There's loads and loads of them, but they're not, I suppose they're not equipped and they're not 
trying to, to reach Irish people. So there's, there was three churches that were even making an effort to reach Irish people. Um, so 230,000 people and three churches. So we managed to get that number up to four. So <laughs> statistically, things are, are looking better. And there's um, some other groups are, are planning on planting some churches. So it's it's great to, that this has been identified as a, a massive area of need. That area down the bottom left, that, that purple area, is is our patch. There was no gospel presence of any kind. Um, Fifty two thousand people in that area. So we've um, that's where we we've been focused on planting a church. Um, there's two big things that shape ministry in North Dublin. Um, North Dublin is post Catholic. Um, it's there's studies, this is a pretty old study, maybe 10 years ago. Um, North Dublin has by far the least, the lowest mass attendance. You know, it's, it's almost entirely Catholic. Um, and mass attendance, oh, I don't remember exactly, it's down around 5 10%. So you have people who've been very shaped by the Catholic Church, but don't believe it anymore, don't go. But it still shapes the way they think in a deeper way than they can uh, understand or imagine. This building um, was the largest parish church building in Ireland. That was so. If you walk out the door of our house and, and look up the hill to the left, um, this was dominating the hill. It had a great size in the centre of, of this area called Finglas West. That was when they built it in the fifties. They built the area. It was a greenfield site, and they built this big, big Catholic parish church in the middle, and houses all around it in kind of in circles, um, and. It must have cost a crazy amount of heat, so they and it was never full. Pretty much, it was um, it was never even ten percent full, really. Um, so three ish years ago, they knocked it down, um, and they're planning on building. I think it's a two or three hundred seater um, <coughs> place, um, and I think that just shows. So this is a quite a big area, and the Catholic Church is saying we don't have any points. Let's just consolidate. And um, former Archbishop of, of Dublin lives in our area. My, my wife actually knows him from her Catholic days, and he is very negative about, he's very pessimistic about the, the prospects for any kind of renewal or any kind of growth or anything. So they're managing the climb. And a lot of the people I meet with grew up in the Catholic Church to some extent. Some people are very bitter. Some people are kind of a bit nostalgic. Um, I tend to find the older the person is, the more bitter they are. Um, you do meet it to some older people who are, who are genuine, still attending Mass, but most older people are quite bitter, probably around from 40 up, more bitter, and then from 40 down, it's more uh, nostalgic they, because they're, they don't have that much experience of it, so they kind of are um, a little bit positive. Um, We've had a few people coming to us because they don't know the difference um, between us and, the, and they're like, oh, my granny used to go to church and they'll come along to us. And then honestly, it'll take two or three months to figure out that our message is different. And I, I like to think we're being pretty clear, but it's, it's that level of kind of lack of knowledge of Catholic teaching or the Bible or anything like that. The other big one, uh, so the Catholic influence is failing and the, the thing that's increasing is diversity um, so it's it's a more affordable part of the city to live in than, than others so a lot of recent immigrants who come will, will look to live there um, particularly Ashton so this is uh, where our church meets just down the middle road there um, and that's pretty typical of um, where we live there's um, there's a lot of like six seven story apartment blocks and then there are they're starting to build more and there's 14 story apartment blocks and a lot of people there's two main groups of people there'd be young professionals couples living in this lovely apartment um and an immigrant family with like 10 of them crammed into the same lovely apartment but it's not as lovely if there's so many of you so that's um we live just a couple of minutes away um we were praying for uh this would have been five six years ago we were praying for god to to provide a house um, and we were I worked as a civil engineer and my wife as a social worker and we, we worked at that because we we're convinced that it's an expensive place to buy a house but to be there long term that made sense um, so the early stages of the 
So the church plant started meeting in our house, I think a month after we, we moved in. Um, this is the early days. Um, so this is COVID. We, um, we were small enough we, to, to meet outside. Um, and uh, we, so that was a, a strain. We'd, we'd just started, we'd be meeting for a little while on Sunday evenings in our house every second week. And then COVID happened. And a group of people who we'd gathered weren't really part of any church. Some of them had were Christians who'd been through some pretty bad church experiences. Some had just been on the fringes of, of church or not committed. Um, Jamestown Road Church, which sent us out, was a reasonably small church, and so we didn't want to pull away too many people from that. So there was no one who was actually a church member. There was a couple of people who had just become believers um, who joined us. So that was... A hard couple of years. We met two summers. We met in that park in a, in a circle, um, and the train goes by, and so every thirteen minutes, I'd be I'd be preaching, and uh, you just have to have a little reflection pause because the train would uh, would go by. It's quite loud. Um, but I think that that was quite a formative thing. What I used to say is, a church is just a bunch of people who are, who are gathered around Jesus and His Word, um, and that's um, it's nice to have more than that. Um, but at the, at the very essence, that's what they are as a church. Um, this is uh, this picture is a little bit old. This was probably one of the first Sundays we moved into the local community centre. So this was around this time three years ago, um, and God just really blessed us with that. We used to spread out the chairs to try and make the room look full, and, and now it's we're um, we're not packing out the hall, but it is reasonably full, and that's nice. So last Sunday, a guy came in for the first time, um, and he said, I just want to say it's the back row. Um, and when you're that small, when we were 10 or 12 people, there's no back row. Um, and so it's nice to that people who, have, who just want to sit back and observe uh, can, can come along. Um, so um, God's really blessed us with that. And I suppose something you can be praying for, that it's not the most suitable building. Um, we can, we're only allowed to use it for a couple of hours on a Sunday, and it's quite difficult to, to get access. So... In the next couple of years, we'll probably need to move somewhere else. But so it's been really great up to now, but um, it's quite difficult to find somewhere to, to meet. Um, we've had a few baptisms. This is um, the third baptism we had. The, the first one we had was um, a young um, Egyptian Irish woman. Her parents are Egyptian, and um, she had grown up in church um, and was discipled by Anya and uh, became a believer. She invited her friends to her baptism. Um, one of them continued coming along um, and um, this is her baptism probably two years later. Um, and this is her. She's a lot of friends. So she invited uh, an awful lot of friends over to, um, to her baptism. And these are people who've never heard the gospel before. Some of them are uh, immigrants, you know, so then maybe they come from um, some kind of nominal Christian family. But my experience of the Christian immigrants and the immigrant churches is they tend to be fairly unhealthy. A lot of time there's abusive leadership or just the gospel isn't preached or prosperity gospel or some other false teaching. Um, some of them, I'm sure, must be, be preaching the gospel faithfully, but I honestly haven't met any of them yet in all their efforts. So. For, for these people to come and, and hear the gospel is, is very powerful. Um, I love this picture. This is um, the baptism. Marshall is um, on the left, me on the right. Um, princess baptized in the middle. And um, Marshall's the husband of the, the friend who told my wife the gospel as a, as a teenager. Um, and they've joined the church. And the church um, recognized us as elders about... Uh, about this time last year. So I love this picture because there's a little head there in the corner um, over the far side. It was just a man out for his Sunday afternoon swim. And um, and he's in the sort of, stuff. I was busy. I was trying to remember about if what to say and did, do, I haven't done that many baptisms. So I didn't notice, but in all the pictures, um, this man is just there and he's kind of paddling on his back, just looking, watching this baptism happen with a kind of a, mild curiosity he didn't come over and ask anybody anything he's just there watching and i think that's that's a good example of what north dublin is like now he's 20 years ago you know when my parents were baptized 30 years ago 
people would have stayed away. <laughs> you know, there was like some kind of religious thing going on on the beach. People are going to leave the beach. Um, and so for it to be so post-Christian, it's Catholic, that people are mildly curious is is massive progress. Um, I was, had a great couple of days last week that I, I just, um, with the guys coming from the Baptist College, the team um, coming, um, I, we're going to be doing a couple of evangelism. So I've been praying for evangelism opportunities and I was praying for them next week. But I think God, maybe they need to encourage me. I, last Thursday and Friday, I just uh, got into lots, at least four conversations about the gospel with people that you wouldn't expect, you know, just if they ask what I do for work, you know, as if you, people just have various local things and you can say the gospel and they're still pretty resistant to believing it for themselves, but they say, okay, if that's, if that works for you, you know, or like that sounds like it's an interesting thing for you, which 15 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. It would have just shut the conversation down, changed the subject or walked away. Um, so I, I'm very excited about the, the mild curiosity and difference. Um, our church um, is, um, we have 15 church members. We constituted um, last, the 4th of November last year um, and um, had 12 and three have joined since. Um, this is, this was my strategy to, so this is a church members meeting. We kind of feed people full of food and then we, we had, because it's quite difficult to constitute as a church with some votes and different things. So we wanted people to be well fed and happy. Um, so around that table, I think that was most of the original 12. Um, one of them has had been, no one grew up in a, a Baptist church. One had been a member of, uh, for quite a few years. Um, people, there's people there who two years previously had been very against church membership or very against all kinds of things that were part, we wanted the church to be about. Um, and it was just beautiful to see how God changed some of those people. It just, it looked very unlikely um, that God would bring us together to, to be a church. Um, and um, it's been very beautiful to see, to be honest, those people. And um, because we come from a variety of, of different backgrounds, there's there's actually a lot of different gifts and ability that, that God has given us. And that I feel like, it's, I like that it's my role to kind of just keep us herded together into the one direction. Um, but, among that group of church members there's a lot of evangelistic opportunities um, a lot of people who've been living in the area for a long time and maybe weren't weren't telling people the gospel because they weren't part of a church but now that they're part of a church they're just getting encouraged to take the opportunities they have um, so we've seen some not, not fruit in terms of people becoming believers but people getting a lot more confident in speaking the gospel um, and um, and people bringing friends to church and, and things like that. Um, this is, we had a church day away, this was I think last February, um, that's most of us there. Um, and um, on the left, um, the, the couple on the far left became believers about a year ago, um, and uh, John and Grace, and pretty early on, John's quite a simple guy. <laughs> he just says, fairly straightforward, he says, like what do Christians do? You know, we went through some of the basics and we were having an evangelistic event and he's invited his friend Ricardo. So Ricardo and his wife, Johanna, um, have been coming along and I think have become believers and so have that kind of conversation figuring out with them. Um, and that's just really encouraging for us to, uh, John and Grace get married in December and we hope to get baptized in um January, we're trying to figure out the, the sea will be a bit cold in January. We'll probably have an indoor baptism somewhere, but, but early next year. So you can pray for, for John and Grace and um, pray for other people in the church to be encouraged by the, it's not that complicated to tell people the gospel. Um, we're having a team from the Baptist College next week. Brian's going to be involved in that. We're, we're um, I suppose that's it. We, we, we want to tell people the gospel. We're very conscious we're a small church. People are doing a pretty good job of speaking the gospel to their friends and family and neighbours, but the vast, vast majority of people around us aren't hearing the gospel, have never met a Christian, never heard the gospel. Um, so what we want to do is, I think of it as gospel coverage, we just want to throw out the net a bit more um, and um, 
be grateful to the best come in doing that. I'm <coughs> the evangelism has been much better through the women in the church than through men. Um, I think that's just we've got two women in particular, which is very gifted evangelists, probably three. Um, and um, so I'm praying for more men to believe the gospel. Um, so because the team is six guys, um, we're going to be running a men's event um, next Thursday night. I've called it what Jesus says about being a man. Um, and um, I, it's very hard to know when people with free will will, will come to something, uh, but we're, we're inviting people. And John, I've seen that the message of Jesus has transformed his life. He's going to give a testimony. Um, and a few other friends who hopefully will come along who have had that conversation about who, who want values. They want to know how to be a good husband, good father, but they've got nothing they, they don't they're not even aware of what the bible teaches what the gospel is so pray that that some of those guys will come and, and hear the gospel and um, there'd be a few guys that i've had a few good conversations with already and it'd be nice to push that on to the next level um how your church helps ours um Sandy brian has not didn't make it on the list but that's um pray for god to save people um i think that's uh, I've been praying specifically for, for men. So two men to pray for. For one is Marcus. I've I've had that conversation a lot with him about building your life on the solid rock of Jesus over the last few years. He's a very good friend and his wife is a good friend of ours. Um to pray for Marcus. Um and pray for Richard, whose whose wife is a part of the church and a church member and um which is a fairly strong Catholic and um we want to respect his beliefs, but also we want to present the gospel to him. And they're having a baby um, next, you know, probably next week. And so, um, hoping to meet with him a bit over his paternity leave and um, just talk through things a bit more. So pray for for Marcus and Richard, please. Um, giving the Baptist missions. Um, so Baptist missions have been running target one thousand. So to to get a um, thousand people to. It doesn't give me any more money, but it enables other people to do what I've been doing in other places. So there's so many areas of North Dublin that could do with new church plants um, and so many other parts of Ireland. Um, I think there are 930 people come back for Target 1000. So um, if that can't be you uh, and to, to, to think about contributing financially, just maybe pray that we will get to that. I think it's I thought it was a bit ambitious at the, at the time when I heard about Target 1000, but, but God has answered the prayers um, and it really does, it enables more ministry. Being an example of a healthy church, um, this church has been around a lot longer than ours. Um, and for, for me, I get, to, I get to visit churches in our association and see what how God is at work and it's a massive encouragement. And I have to filter that back to, to our church and it there there there's not a huge awareness of the bigger association of churches um but i find that the more exposure our church members get the more they get encouraged that's been the story of my life as i've last few years as i've gone to more things i mean it is encouraging because there's a lot of churches in the public of ireland that are just struggling um and they're doing great stuff but just don't feel like there's that many christians so to, to see that there's other christians in the world that you care about what we're doing that you're doing the same thing here um, it's really encouraging encouraging anyone to move to dublin to consider our church um or um what another church plant in the future um i'm conscious a lot of people move for college or for work for six months or a year or something like that if we had had someone move join us for six months in those early days it would have been absolutely transformative um it really it doesn't have to be a long-term thing we had a couple from cork from one of the, the baptist churches in cork with us for two years for a work thing it was it, we knew it wasn't going to be long term and it was it coincided with the pretty much the, the COVID time and that i think god would have kept us going a different way but that was one of god's primary ways of keeping us going just having them it's great to have support from the outside, but to have people supporting from inside, it's, it's massive. So if you know anybody, uh, feel free to pass on my, my details. Um, I hope you're subscribed to Baptist Mission Prayer News. Um, so every two weeks we put out an update and you can pray for us. And it's, I try and keep it fairly specific. Um, and 
person who I find you good to, to free for the other workers in Ireland. Um, that's a, I think about the hard one to have some players, some uh, players outside. Um, but honestly, we, we do appreciate your support. We really appreciate um, the things God's doing across our association. Um, I'm, I'll stick around as long as people want to talk to me this evening. So if you have, I'd love to hear more about what's going on in your church. 600 and something children are hopefully going to be at the um, the amazing journey. That is <coughs> an awful lot. Like we are so far from having that kind of reach. And so I think to <coughs> recognize that God is giving you opportunities for us spread this gospel here as well. Um, we're going to look at a psalm that has been helpful to me, particularly, but, um, and our churches will look at this over the summer. Um, and <coughs> I'd read this over the years, um, I, but I'd never really thought it through. And but the phrase just stuck in my mind. So the first line of Psalm 127. Um, I'll read verses um, 1 and 2 of Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. And that that was just rattling around in my back and my head, kind of unconsciously that that um, the Lord builds the house. Um, and it's nice to come here and give the you know the boiled down version of the last few years, but it didn't it doesn't always feel like things are, are going well. You know, often there's there's discouragement, there's people who walk away, um, and um, that's that's very hard to take, people you care about. Um, and often the successes and the failures come at the same time um, and you see the gospel advance in one person's life and one person would seem to be growing kind of and fall back and I don't personally I find I, I take it easy it's easy to take the good stuff the successes for, for granted but the the negatives always hurt you know the, the someone walking away um, always hurts um, and so this psalm, I think, is really useful for thinking about that whole idea of success and failure. So it's written by Solomon. Um, and Solomon knew about, he knew a lot about some things. He knew a lot about building. Um, he knew a lot about cities. He knew a lot about success. And his reflection is, unless God builds it, it's, it's in vain. And I think he's, he doesn't have that many examples as kings. Um, he's thinking back to Saul. I think Saul is a classic example. Saul seemed, you know, from a human point of view, he was going to be a great king. And this is what he did. Saul built his kingdom. He seemed to start off pretty well with God. But as things went on, he got further and further away from God. He didn't build his, his kingdom with God. And, and it, as Saul failed more, he started clutching at things that weren't, God, he started trying to build his own kingdom in his own way. And Solomon is thinking about that, I think. Um, he's thinking about David, how David wasn't like that, how David succeeded. But he's thinking about himself, that he's succeeded far more than David. A lot of the things, you know, when you talk about building, building the temple is you know, Solomon's big achievement. He's thinking, God has built this house. You know, <laughs> Called the temple the house, and, and um, but Solomon has been very involved. And you read the the details. Solomon is ordering timber. He's he's organizing people in quarries. He's doing a lot of work. He's working very hard, but he's very conscious that unless it's God who works to build it, then it's it's in vain. Um, he's at a time when self confidence, or he's at a stage of life, I think, uh, when self confidence would come very naturally. Um, and in Dublin, it's, I'm always amazed by how self-confident people are. It's not 
it's not normal for Irish people to be so self-confident. For years, we were a bit held down and repressed, and the, the, the Catholic Church was good at keeping you humble in many ways. And with that gone, people are very confident. Um, a lot of people are making a lot of money and succeeding. And self-confidence can be a good thing, but it trains us to have less confidence in God. Um, God made us to have um, confidence, but made us have confidence. He made us want to, to work, to try things, to try to succeed, but with him. Except the Lord build a house, they labour in vain that build it. It's, it has to be done with him. And so Solomon's uh, thinking about the, he's, he's, you know, he's a practical guy, he understands construction and he's, he understands what needs to be done. There's physics, there's building materials, there's trustworthy wor uh, workers, there's all these things. And he understands that those need uh, work. But above that and through that, it's, it's the Lord who builds the house. And the second example is, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wait for God in vain. And I think that's it. This is an easier one to, to understand because the watchman's job isn't to fight the battles. So you know, if an enemy army comes, the watchman doesn't run off as soon as he sees them and fights them. The watchman has, has a simple job. He sees the enemy army coming. He alerts the, his own army. They wake up, they get ready for a battle. But um, in Jerusalem, when you, the, the enemies that were coming up and attacking the Assyrians that came, um, the, these, these other surrounding nations were far more powerful. Um, and I think the watchman knows he has a limited role. The watchman knows that unless God is actually working on the side of his people, they're going to be defeated. That's just the, that's the simple message of all those battles with the Philistines. When God's fighting for them, they win. When God's not fighting for them, they don't win. And God's control for Solomon isn't a reason to, to sit back, but it's a reason to, to build. You know, it's a reason to do something. I think you can see that in his life. Um, and this, the second half of the psalm kind of goes on, and it seems strange. We don't have time to get into it, but he starts talking about children, our heritage from the Lord. Um, and the big idea of that second half is the things that really matter in life. Um, and for, in that culture, you know, that was very much your family passing on your success to the, the next generation are a heritage of the Lord. God's the one who gives the things that really matter. You don't control the most important things in your life. God does. Um, so our success, anything that we succeed at is God's blessing. Um, I think in, in church planting, a lot of the time, you, you have that clear. Uh, the early days when things, you just don't know how things are going to work out. You're praying a lot and you think, we need God to bless this and make it work. Um, and I would say pretty much most people are like that. But the danger is that when the church has grown and become established, you start to look back and you think, oh, we did, we did okay. But the reality is, regardless of how hard we work, it's, if God doesn't work, it's not going to happen. It's not going to get built. And Psalm is thinking back to this, this promise God made to, to David. Uh, so in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David says, um, Here I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God remains in a, in a tent in a tabernacle. And he's, he wants to, to build this temple for God. And God says, You're not going to be the one to build me a temple. You're not going to build me a house. I'm going to, to build you a house. And there's this amazing promise of much bigger than a temple. Um, God is going to build this dynasty. Solomon or David's descendants are going to, there's, there's going to be one who's going to rule forever as the king. And Solomon's been thinking about that because he's David's son. And if those promises seem, seem to be coming true. He has succeeded. He has built the temple, all these things. But, and I'm sure a lot of people thought Solomon was the, the fulfillment of that promise. But I think Solomon knows he's not. Um, I think he, he knows that he's just someone who God has, his work he has blessed. Um, he knows he's not going to be king forever. Maybe he wrote this psalm as he was getting older, he was facing that reality. As good as things were for Solomon, they weren't as good as God promised. And it's interesting to see how this works for Jesus. From the world's perspective, Jesus looked like a failure. That's, you know, crucifixion is, was as 
clear failure as you could that was as you can imagine that was what the Romans were doing in crucifixion they were showing this person's a failure and he died young he didn't have children he wasn't a successful king but Jesus builds this house that will last forever um, he says I'll, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it and he's building a city the watchman can't keep the city safe but Jesus is building a, a new Jerusalem which is safe you know it's, it's secure because he is he's God who keeps his city safe keeps his people safe um, and that's for me that's really helpful in thinking about like ministry Jesus succeeds Jesus is going to build his church and he is building his church and the way he builds his church is by normal local churches like ours proclaiming Christ planting churches so Jesus' success is completely guaranteed. Ours isn't. His churches isn't. Um, churches, local churches don't last forever. We don't. God, God uses us to advance his kingdom. Um, and then hopefully we get a few hundred years um, and the gospel spreads. But the, the thing, the one thing that will last forever is Jesus' church. And for me, that gives me confidence because we can fail um, and it doesn't you know our salvation is still secure um, I think it's a, a danger in mi- any kind of ministry I think or leadership that your identity gets wrapped up in in your successes and your failures and what you do and what you don't do but I think this speaks very powerfully to that it's God's the one who's building his house building his city we just get to be part of that and what he's done for us in saving us by the blood of Jesus on the cross is way way more important than what we do for them what we do for them we should try things and work hard and take opportunities to start churches to proclaim christ but that's not the thing the decisive thing in our lives the decisive thing is what god has done um there's a lovely line here in verse two uh, so verse two says it's vain for you to rise up early to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows the soul he giveth his beloved sleep. I just think that's a lovely line. Um, someone said to me a few years ago, um, everyone in Dublin is tired and unhappy. And I was like, oh, no, that can't be true. And, I, and the more I, I'm not sure about the unhappy. Most people are unhappy, but absolutely everybody is tired. Like every, especially when you've just, our youngest son is three years old and our oldest is seven. So I feel like we've had, We've come through seven, eight years of just tiredness. Um, and I can see it now that we were very tired. Um, but we didn't feel like it at the time because everybody around us was way more tired. Um, the, the Christians are, are more rested generally, even in Dublin, even when they're tired. But the non Christians around us are just exhausted. And every, it's pretty much every two years there's a, a fad a kind of a rest fad um it was brunch for a while um it was artisan bread and people would people on a saturday people would queue for two hours for bread um and it was good bread like i didn't queue but i, I had tasted it but honestly that bread isn't going to to give you the rest you need it's not going to bring you fulfillment um the moment it's saunas so the last Six months has been sawn. There's all every every um, bit of waste ground has been turned into you know, someone gets five or six saunas and puts them in, and that's what people do at the weekend. That's what they they're so tired, and that's what they're looking for rest. And I think saunas are good, they're better than bread, but it's just it's so it's such a weak rest. You know, it might make you feel good for a little while, but um, God gives His beloved sleep, and isn't for us as we are active in speaking the gospel i think that's really important to remember we god gives us opportunities and we we work hard but <coughs> knowing that it's god's work that matters lets us we do our we take our opportunities to speak the gospel and we go home and we rest um, so the team are coming next week and I've been on a couple of mission teams in the past where it's it's just all like it's it's just all going and maybe as a church you want to extract all the the work out of them while they're with you um and i think it's okay to be pushed a little bit but i think this is really helpful reminder that it's 
it's God who works. Um, 600 and something children who hear the gospel through Amazing Jenny. That is amazing. Um, and it's so it's good to put effort into it when you get an opportunity like that and to pray that God will build something spiritually in their lives through that. Um, if you ask most um, people in Dublin what they think we believe, um, it'd be like being, we want to be good, we want to do religious things because that somehow saves us. Certain, I think that's kind of a, a vague idea um, that about what we do. You know, that kind of, it's like a toned down version of the Catholic cheap teaching about, about works. Um, that kind of, people don't even think about it. That's just, they assume religion is about doing stuff. But here, religion, real religion, Christianity, is about what God has done for us. Um, it's about resting in Christ's work. And I find for us, the way we in rest, the way we have um, just peace uh, based on Christ's work for us is probably the most attractive thing about the, the gospel. There's a lot of things people don't like about the Bible, about the gospel, but when they see how Christians in our church are better at resting and just enjoying the life God has given them, that is very attractive. Um, so I find the two things that are attractive about our church. Um, our church community and the kind of quality of life that we don't have to be queuing up for for hours. We come and regularly just worship God together and show that we're enjoying that we're resting in Him. So pray for that. Um, that our church will be good at that. I have a lot of conversations among a lot of people who are just doing too much um, and and kind of very competent and able people but a lot of the time I just say it's trust what Jesus has done for us and then then that will give you things to do. Solomon did plenty of work because he was conscious of God's that it was God who would do the work. Um, can I pray for your church? Um, can I pray for the week coming up? Um, and um, Father, thank you that um, you are at work. Uh, thank you that Jesus is building his church, that um, his Holy Spirit is at work where his word is heard. Um, pray for this um, this evangelism team that, that comes that day um, as they work and as they take this opportunity that they will be conscious and, and uh, enjoying and delighting in the gospel of Jesus. And pray for, for this church to delight in the gospel as we take these opportunities to speak it. Thank you that we can enter Jesus' rest. Um, thank you for the partnership that we have in the gospel in our church in this. Um, and we pray that you will just continue to develop that, um, that we'll see that what you're doing is um, it's magnificent, that you save people we wouldn't expect to be saved, um, that you build a house, that you build churches, places we wouldn't expect churches to be. We pray that you'll keep doing this powerfully by your spirit as your word is spoken. Amen.